Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Carrad Writer, and this week we're going way, way back in time. We're going to do a real, real classic movie for you. This week we're doing the musical drama titled Oliver. Now, Oliver runs for two hours and 33 minutes long. It is directed by Carol Reed. Now, I know what you're thinking. What? You mean this movie was directed by a female? Well, to all the feminists out there, I have to be the bearer of bad news. The movie was not directed by a female. It's just a man with a female name named Carol Reed. I know, I know what you're thinking. I thought at first this was a female director, but as it turns out, Carol Reed is a male with just a female first name. All right, it is all right. Enough of that. Okay, the it is produced by John Wolfe. The script was written by Vernon Harris. Of course, it is based off of the classic Charles Dickens. Uh, book titled Oliver Twist and and in 1960 it was eventually made its way as a as a musical written by Lionel Bart the lyrics and the score was was done by Lionel Bart and John Green the cinematography was done by Oswald Morris and it was edited by Ralph Kemblin. And the stars of the movie are Mark Lester as the titular character Oliver Twist. Also joining us in this movie, we have Ron Moody, who pretty much reprises his role from the, from the British stage to the screen as Fagan. We also have Shani Wallace as Nancy, Oliver Reed, who was Carol Reed's nephew. He uh, played Bill Sykes. We also had uh, comedic actor Harry Seco making the transition to being in a drama role. He is in there. He's, of course, Mr. Bumble. Jack Wilde, who, of course, famous for being in the Sid and Marty Croft show in the 70s. If you guys grew up in the 70s and watched those cheesy Sid and Marty Croft shows, you may have remembered him from the show H.R. Puffin Stuff before he actually became an adult and literally started to Puffin Stuff. <laughs> there is a drug reference to H.R. Puffin Stuff. If you don't know that, you're blind. Also, drawing uh, the crowds, we have Hugh Griffith. We have Joseph O'Connor as Mr. Brownlow. Peggy Mount as Widow Corny. Leonard Rossiter as uh, Mr. Sourberry. Let's see, we have Hilda Baker, Kenneth Cranham, Megs Jenkins, Sheila White, and James. Hater. Now, surely, if I had a choice to choose between reading the original Charles Dickens classic Oliver Twist and watching the musical based on the iconic story, I still think that the novel fares better. I mean, it's just much more better detailed. I think one of the big weaknesses with the transformation from novel to musical to film was that at least the book actually does score more points in terms of honesty, even if honesty is not always the safest thing. It doesn't water things down, and it doesn't just make everything seem so spontaneous, whimsical, and saccharine. I mean, the story of Oliver Twist is actually a very, very dark story. I mean, I know Charles Dickens has had an attempt of making all kinds of stories that might seem whimsical and spontaneous at first, but there's a lot of dark undertones. You get that in Nicholas Nickleby, you get that in Great Expectations, and you also get that, of course, in The Christmas Carol, which is, of course, one of the most heavily adapted 
book to film stuff going on. I mean, the stories of Ebenezer Scrooge has been dated all the way back to the 1930s with Reginald Owen. And then, you know, there has been a myriad of other adaptations over the years. Oliver Twist has also had its share of uh, adaptations and interpretations with different takes and different and different angles. But still, like I said, and maybe I might be considered old hat here, but yes, it's always better to just read the novel than to or just read the novel first and then watch the movie so you could get a better understanding of the movie. And you also can also pinpoint much better where things were good and which things were wrong. Let's not try and be too over cynical. And I'm going to try my best, in my best capacity possible, not to make this sound like a complete rant. But this film adaptation of the musical based on the novel has a lot of red herrings. And I probably am going to pinpoint them out. But like I said, Honesty is still the best policy. I mean, that's not to say that this musical is bad or anything like that. It's just that Dickens's novel pulls no punches in its interpretation of what it was like to live in London in the early 19th century and the harsh conditions the urban dwellers were facing at the time. Well, let's face it, the Industrial Revolution was still in its in its infancy. It was not perfectly landscaped. I mean, there was a lot of pollution. There was a lot of factories. There was, of course, the urban sprawl and population was all just, you know, all getting all bunched in there together. I mean, the rich were very rich and the poor were very poor. Middle class? What middle class? You were either rich or you're poor. There was no middle class. And, you know, like I said, the Industrial Revolution had its benefits, but it also had a myriad of its liabilities. You know, pollution, smog, destitute, homeless. You know, you think that when you go into the urban cities, you're chasing your dream only to realize that all this dream and all this visions of lollipops and rainbows is really all just hyperbole. And that's kind of like what Charles Dickens was pinpointing out. As much as you hate to know the truth, the truth can hurt. And if you can't take the heat, well, too fucking bad. Even though the musical adaptation still has the grim settings of the novel, I mean, no kidding. I can't help but feel that, there, that the musical adaptation has been watered down a bit to the point of being too cheery and family-friendly, even though the novel is really anything but just because you stuck a child in the leading role doesn't necessarily mean that it's child-friendly or it's cheery. So under the direction of Carol Reed, I think he did a tremendous job in an effort of bringing the adaptation to the big screen. However, I still don't think it compares to the best film he ever directed, which was 1949's The Third Man. Like The Third Man, Oliver, Reed utilizes kind of the same trademark strategy of canted angles and the dolly movements that are esoterically featured throughout. Now that might be good for like basement film studios, but if you're going to create an atmosphere to look like 19th century London, you got to kind of make things seem a little less obvious. That's kind of like where the big weakness is. It might be just sort of the technical aspects that are the red herrings. 
And I'm not saying that the performances don't have red herrings. They do, but I mean, some of it are, is hit and miss, but I, I will get more into that a little bit later on. Now, I'm not going to say that it's easy to make the transformation to the stage to the screen because, believe it or not, it takes a lot of money. It takes a big, heavy budget. It takes a lot of long hours and long days to build a city to look like 19th century London. It doesn't get finished in a day. It might take months, and it may take a lot of money to get it under construction. You also have to have approval from city officials if they if they have the licensing and the permission to actually set their stages, their movies ahead in that specific particular location to wherever it's built. Or if not, they're just going to have to stick to the Pinewood Studios in London to make their movie. And I think that's kind of like what happened... Maybe they must have ran out of budget. Maybe they must have ran out of money. So they just had to settle for a studio and make sure that the fans don't see into it that this is a movie and not a theater, a not a theatrical thing. But it felt more theatrical than it did as a movie. And we can all see through that. One of the big numbers called reviewing the situation, we clearly see the contrast in the character of Fagin than compared to the real intentions from the novel. Alright, this is where the whole watered down thing comes into prominence here, you see. Now, I hate to do race politics in my broadcasts, but uh, for the record, and it comes as a no denial that the legendary, iconic author, Charles Dickens, as much as we all love him, he was kind of borderline racist. We see that a lot in his novels. Maybe it's not like blatantly like out and in our faces, but it is there. And Oliver is no exception. Fagin... Make no mistake about it, defied the stereotypical Jew. He is an opportunist. He he lets little kids go out and do his dirty deeds, you know, stealing from rich people just so that he can make a profit. And he's no freaking Robin Hood where, you know, rob the rich, live the poor. No, no. Rob the rich. Bring it to me, I'll make some money out of it, and I'm going to keep the money all to myself. Oh, don't worry, the kids get some form of restitution for their efforts, having a bed and some food and a little shelter in some hidden area in London so they won't get caught. And he does nurture to their wills, but still, nonetheless, He's a jewel thief. He's a pickpocketer. He's he's a scoundrel. Oh, did I also mention he was Jewish too? I did. So suit me. Well, yeah. I mean, you see, in the in the novel, he's practically like a secondary villain in the story. I'm sure he's got the. The pickpocketers stealing from rich people or just grabbing anything they can get their grubby hands on. And then he tries to make a profit out of them, whatever it is they bring in. And if they can abide by their contributions, he feeds them and gives them shelter and a bed to sleep on. But anyways, he abides by... By one of the seven deadly sins that kind of badly stereotypes Jewish people. Greed. I know you don't like to hear these kind of things, and I don't even like to say it. But it's the truth. And like I said before, and I'll say it again, the truth hurts. Don't like it? 
Don't listen. Believe what you want to believe. I mean, the guy was just as much not far from being an antagonist next to Bill Sykes. But in the musical adaptation, even more so in the movie, Fagin, played by Ron Mo Moody, is definitely played safe as a sympathetic master thief who's like a mentor to these young scoundrels. And during his number, when he spots the noose, when he brings, when he sings to the lyrics of trials and tribulations, we can see that what he's doing is a dangerous job that could get him caught. And of course, if he gets caught, he's not going to be sentenced to life in prison. No, no, no. London had much more stricter criminal, criminal codes of conduct. You commit a misdemeanor, you're dead. And when he saw that noose, especially through the words, trials, and tribulations from that song doing the situation, you can clearly see that there is fear manifesting inside of him. He knows that if he gets caught, I wonder what his neck size is to fit that noose. Do executioners measure the size of your neck? Let's see, you take a size 7, a 7.5. And, oh, I think this noose will fit great around your neck. Oh, looks like it's time for another execution. <laughs> hang on. <laughs> Get it? Noose, hang on. Okay. I mean, let's face it. I would not want to be in his shoes in more ways than one. I mean, his line of work could get him in trouble if he doesn't take precautions. And I think they were making him just way too careful that no one would be offended or that no one could see who he was. But if you're a diehard fan of the novel, a diehard fan of Charles Dickens, you'll know that Racism was a big factor in a lot of his stories, and there were, of course, a lot of badly done stereotypes that helped or dappered a lot of his stuff. And he didn't show any apologies to it. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go out and take every Charles Dickens adaptation and burn it. Come on now. Haven't we had enough of burning and destroying things already? We don't need that anymore. We don't need it now. We don't need it ever. Let's try and be civilized. Or has civilization become obsolete in the world we live in? I don't know anymore. With the high level of creativity in making this movie, there will always be some hit or miss in terms of proceedings that can be both thrilling, while at times there are moments that are very, very off-putting. In spite of the bombastic songs like Consider Yourself, the situations definitely have an airless atmosphere within the plot. I mean, why would you want to sing a glorious song like Consider Yourself and Enjoying the Days of Being a Pickpocket? Wouldn't it be great if you actually went into a school, studied, worked hard, and become rich yourself? That way you don't have to take from the rich. You can earn the stuff by being rich. I mean, underneath all that, underneath all that songs of optimism and cheeriness, there's really not much to cheer about.
performance wise, it seems like the actors who played their respected roles was definitely made for each other. And that there was no second guessing. To me, I actually thought the acting had some hit or miss. We had some really good performances. And then there were just a few that were meh. Which means that they were good, but could have been better. Maybe not exactly at the fault of the performers. They gave whatever effort they did and what material was given to them. Some were just like near perfect, while others were kind of hit and miss. But overall, I think a lot of these worlds were definitely were meant to be. Personally, do you know who really actually turned in the best performance in this movie? I gotta have hands off to Oliver Reed as Bill Sykes. Reed was just perfect. I mean, this was what you... I mean, obviously... Bill Sykes was going to be the villain in the story. I mean, if you look at the icy glare in those blue eyes, if you just look at, at, at his menacing scowl, his kind of somewhat frightening entrance into him when he was when he first introduced when we're first introduced to him, he only comes in like roughly about half an hour into the movie. But when he comes in, it's like a flash of lightning. Making the dark cloud darker. From like charcoal gray to chrome black. I mean, this guy injected fear without really having to say much, without really having to do much. I mean, his cold, calculated demeanor itself can eject fear. I mean, his live-in girlfriend with Nancy, he really shows little to no uh, expressions towards her. He's the type of guy who, the first minute you look at him, you want something, you give it to him. No second-guessing and no bullshitting. Whatever he wants, just give it. No arguments. That's the kind of role he was he was just the perfect villain. Many people had planned that this was going to be a product of nepotism just because his uncle was directing the movie. So, oh, of course, they're going to give it to him. But he made sure that he was going to give out his best performance. And by God, he stole the movie by far. You don't want to mess with Bill Sykes. I mean, the fear that he brings out is something that you would see in a horror film. Oh, that's quite a mouthful. Jack Wilde who I think, in my opinion, was a really, really underrated performer. Started his career as a young kid. I thought that he did also an excellent job as, as the artful Dodger. I mean, he, he just nailed the role to, perf to perfection. And it's just a shame that his career kind of never really materialized to just light-hearted stuff. I mean, you know, by the time he got around to the early 70s, he was singing these light, good, corny, bubblegum pop music that was big in the late 60s, early 70s, songs about sunshine and rainbow and sung and dance type of Brady Bunch, Cow Sills, and Osmond Brothers type stuff. And then, of course, came H.R. Puffin stuff with, you know, the Sid and Marty Crofts, that things. 
by God. I was wondering, is the Artful Dodger role sort of like a curse? Because in the original 19th, I mean, when you think, when I think of the other Artful Dodger, you look at the 1960 original stage musical, and the Artful Dodger was also performed by another performer who left us way too soon, way too young. I'm talking about that's right, Steve Marriott. Steve Marriott from the 60s psychedelic band, The Small Faces, and then turned to a more harder rock-edged group called Humble Pie. You know, we also had Peter Frampton in it. 30 Days in the Hole. Yeah, that's right. Before he became a music sensation, rock band sensation, Steve Marriott was the original Artful Dodger. And both Jack Wilde and Steve... Marriott, of course, produced Cockney accents, which is kind of like working class British accents. You know, it's not hey ho and tally ho. No, it's more like hey ho, tally ho. You know, um, it's, it would be like, it would be like, hello, hello, my name is Eric Ryder, and welcome to the Ryder Review. You know, that's the way, yeah, that's the way all, all the British people, the Cockneys, the, the way how they all speak, you know, they have this kind of incoherent type of voice. I mean, it's just, I mean, what I was sounding right now with that accent was what a Cockney is, you know, like working class, has a little more of a drawl, has a little more of a drawl to their voice, and you know, not like, oh, hippity, hippity, who, you know, no. Almost close to almost like uh, like an Australian accent, but just a little slightly different. It's the way the working class, the peasants, used to speak. But yeah, I, I thought that uh, Jack Wilde did a really good job as the Artful Dodger. I think he actually had an Oscar nominee for Best Actor in a Supporting Role in his role, in his performance. If, if not, then how I... I wouldn't be surprised. And then, uh, and then there's of course Ron Moody, who smoothly made the transition from the stage. He originally played Fagin in the original state London stage version of Oliver, and then he just reprised his role of Fagin in the movie adaptation. And he was just natural. I mean, he just was just so organically natural in his performance. You know, it's more complex than one could imagine. And I think he actually did a very formidable job as as Fagin. You know, it's it's a pretty difficult, complex role. And the transition is, you know, not exactly a very easy climb. But he nailed it off very, very well. So, yeah. And sure, there are exceptional performers who played their roles organically. There are still others who didn't quite measure up to the actors that I have aforementioned. Like I said, it's hit and miss in terms of performances. I just said the hits. Here are a few of the misses. Harry Seacombe, as much as, you know, he used to be part of a comedy team with Spike Milligan called, I think they were called the Goon Squad, him trying to make the transition from being a comedic performer to a much more darker drama type of thing like in Oliver, as much as I would like to see that was um, great that he wanted to exhibit some versatility into his repertoire, but I still think his role was flat out one-dimensional as Mr. Bumble. I mean, basically, he was just a despicable individual who ran an orphanage of of slave driving worker boys, while him and his him and his other government officials are all eating first class meals, while poor kids are stuck eating are stuck eating gruel. 
that would be would just be better off if they would have just had cement. <laughs> yeah. I mean the gruel they had was like ugh. Is this gruel or is this cement? And then when Oliver comes up to him and, you know, begs for a second helping. Hey, Lisa, I want some more. He then lets out this really booming voice. More! It's like, whoa. I mean, at first you would think that, you know, his, his, his loud voice would be like, like something to fear, but in the end, it turns out it was more com comical than fearsome. Also, the fact of the matter is, is that you know, he had, you know, could have had more dimension to him. Also, the same could be said for the character who played Widow Corny. I mean, this is another weakness that came about in this movie. A lot of musical numbers were taken out, which, I mean, I know maybe they were running low on time and didn't have any room for them to have their musical numbers in. I mean, I think Widow Corny and Mr. Bumble were supposed to sing a song called I Shall Scream, which would have given a little more dimension to both Mr. Bumble and Widow Corny, which could have helped them out a little bit better. But in the end, I think if they would have just took Widow Corny out of the equation, nobody would have known the difference. Of course, you know, because of, of Oliver begging Mr. Bumble for more gruel, they thought that he was a pariah. So he sold him off to work as an apprentice for the local undertaker, better known as Mr. Sourberry, which sounds like a taste of a new... Snack from the gummy bears. Hey, kids, have you ever tried our new sour berry patch? Tasty treats from gummy bears? Yeah, that's his name, Mr. Sourberry. Anyhow, yeah. I thought Mr. Sourberry and Mrs. Sourberry were supposed to sing a song called That's Your Funeral, which would have also given a little more backdrop to, you know, Oliver during his days when he was working as Mr. Sourberry's apprentice before getting fired because of their juvenile delinquent son who was a troublemaker who got him into trouble. Yeah. I just think there was a lot of um, numbers missing in this. And I'm not just pointing out at the villains that were, well, Mr. Sourberry was kind of like a mix between protagonist and antagonist. Not. Mr. Brownlow also was not really given much dimension to his character, so he was kind of pretty much forgotten, except for just being a sympathetic rich guy who could probably be a biological relative of Oliver Twist. So I also feel there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's kind of missing here. And I think Harry Seacombe, as much as he might be a great actor, he just overacts his role as Mr. Bumble. Shani Wallace, who plays Nancy, she definitely may have the talent and the a voice as the token compassionate character Nancy even though she's not exactly clean-cut white knight. I mean, she is a bar waitress, and she's also has had a reputation of being somewhat promiscuous. And, of course, she's also the live-in girlfriend of Bill Sykes, because, like all stereotypical women, they just love a bad boy. One who doesn't play by the rules. But I still think she could do better than Bill. 
but she plays too much of a victim to garner any type of sympathy. Now, I know this is going to hurt you all to say this, but you're often wondering and asking, what about the star, the life of the party, the one who is the star of the show? You never mentioned Oliver. I was going to save this one for last, and I never go back on my words. I just had to sort of stall a bit just so that I can finally exhume the truth. Here he goes. I'm going to be docked for saying this. But the weakest character in the movie was the title character of Oliver Twist, played by Mark Lester. I know everybody's saying, Eric, how can you be so mean? He's just a child. And you're saying that he's the weakest character. Well, Jack Wilde as the artful Dodger was just a child, and he was perfect. Okay, I'm not going to say that Mark Lester's performance was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. No. But compared to all the other actors and actresses in this movie, he was just a bit weak. He was just really weak. I mean, I just never really grew on to him. He was just this weary-eyed, one-dimensional kid. I mean, I know his story is, you know, he was just a kid who was, like, wandering around, wondering where he fits in in life. I mean, he doesn't care whether he's whether he's just a a guy who's a kid who's just work who's just like working in a workhouse with a cool mentor like Mr. Bumble. He doesn't care if he's like having to sew up dead bodies at Mr. Sourberry's funeral home, or whether he's out there picking pockets over a rich Jewish swindler like Fagin, or if he's living in the lap of luxury with Mr. Brownlow. All he just wants is to see where he fits in society. He doesn't give a damn whether he's with the rich or with the poor. He just wants to know where the hell he belongs. And I think that's what the story mainly is about. And sure, he was supposed to be lost and naive. And he does capture the role nicely. So I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying it's the worst performance I've ever seen in my life. But the actor actually literally looked lost in his role. It's like... Did the directors had to give him the words from some kind of mouthpiece in order for him to, or did they had to sort of like show the cue cards and were like, read this kid, here, read that, say this, you know, like like someone like spoon feeding him the cue cards. While the others just seem to just so organically play their roles off, it's like brushing flies off a horse. So, um, Carol Reed decided to make Oliver a blonde because, in Reed's frame of mind, blondes are cuter than brunettes, raven haired, or redheads. But then again, this could also perhaps be a bad stereotype of the stereotypical dumb blonde. But, I don't know. Maybe there were like hundreds and thousands of kids out there who were auditioning for the role. But he just had Mark Lester in mind. Not because of talent, but maybe because he was a blonde. Who knows? So all we see in Lester's performance was just a blonde little boy going out into the world, looking for himself. 
and see where he fits in. His dialogue is meager. The things he says seem sort of flat and one-dimensional. And he just couldn't really like rise to the same level as his cohorts. And okay, maybe I'm not being fair that he's just a young kid at the time. And I'm sure, I think I've read somewhere that Mark Lester has actually had another uh, job, another career outside of acting, and he has actually done himself quite well. So you know what? Good for him. I It's, it's very encouraging. Never mind what mean old asshole Eric has said. Never mind me, I'm just being an asshole. He went off and he did a good job in another endeavor. Maybe acting just was not his forte. Maybe he just wanted to collect some extra money to pay off the cookie bill. That's just an old expression I usually use. But still, hey. He just didn't measure up to the other performers. That's all. Nothing bad. When it comes to building sets, production values have come a long way in compared to the golden age of cinema, where sets today take months to build and the budgets in the production values today can be in the millions in terms of currency. But Reed took the backdrop of recreating 19th century London and just built the set entirely in the basements of Shepperton Studios. That's why it looks more staged than it does look authentic. You might as well just turn the cameras to the lights above. Because then you can clearly tell this was not set in an outdoor landscape, but in a studio. That's why I say it feels more staged than it does feel authentic. It's unknown what budget they had when they made it. But the background is quite superficial and even borders laziness in his part. Maybe maybe he ran out of money, I don't know, or maybe just didn't have the money to build a outdoor type atmosphere to recreate 19th century England. For the transformation from stage to screen work, you know, it's complicated. But there needs to be a city that looks like a city and less of a stage setting. So that's why the cinematography was not really up to par. Now I know I've done a lot of, of ranting in this. I've done some r raving as well, you know. I mean, I'm not saying that Oliver was a bad film. Even though most of my reviews sounds predominantly negative. I mean, it was never a dull moment. The songs were entertaining, and the effort to bring this production from stage to screen definitely deserves an ovation. A for effort. And Sir Carol Reed helped recreate a new look from a lighter perspective of the Charles Dickens novel. It's just that it was way too stagey, and the settings were just way too lackadaisical. The songs composed by Lionel Bart were engaging, but definitely also has a level of airiness in it. I mean, sure, you look at a musical like Sweeney Todd the Demon of Barbara of Fleet Street, and you can clearly tell that a lot of their musical numbers is more darker, more sinister, more cynical, but also more believable. 19th century London would not be a place you would want to live at that time. Now, 21st century London, you wouldn't want to live there either, but not as badly as 19th century. Now, in the end, you know... It is still a fun family movie to enjoy, but I just simply can't consider it a masterpiece.
And you know what the worst part is? Is that I actually wanted to make, make you think that it was a masterpiece. But I just can't. Because it does not feel like a masterpiece. It feels like a good fun afternoon for all to enjoy. And it's G-rated. Even though I th really think that the tale of Oliver Twist seems more closer to being PG... PG-16 to an R-rated. Because it is much more darker than what is... than the way how the musical was written. So, when all that's said and done, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I would give Oliver... A 7.5 out of 10. I still recommend you seeing it. I just wouldn't call it a masterpiece. Because of its flaws. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. And if you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind. Be courteous. And please don't write any rude comments. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Redrider saying, keep watching those movies. And I'll see you around. Goodbye.